I'm Jeff Goldberg from The Atlantic, and I welcome you to the part 97 of what to do about the Middle East, uh, the Aspen Ideas Festival. Right now in the Middle East, they're having panels on what to do about the future of Aspen, so it's all, <laughs> it's all working out. Uh, the, uh, so I'll introduce our, our esteemed panel uh, in a second, but I was realizing as I was reading the title of uh, this tutorial. It's called the, the Middle East and the American Electorate, and I realize that there's, there's no verb in that. Um, and I'm really upset about it because I wrote that title. Um, and so uh, the lack of verb, I think, gives me an opportunity to go wherever we want to go on this, on this subject. Um, very quickly, uh, everyone knows Richard Haas. He's been on every panel in Aspen. Um, <laughs> including, you know, green tech sustainability for our bipartisan future. Um, <laughs> Richard runs the Council on Foreign Relations, um, which is a, an insurgent net roots organization based in New York, um, and the author of Foreign Policy Begins at Home, among other things. Next to him is uh, Dave Weigel, who is uh, one of the best young political writers in America, covers politics for Slate, and is also, in my opinion, sort of the go-to guy to understand streams of thought in libertarian and, and, and conservative circles, and we're glad to have you. Uh, in the middle, uh, as opposed to on the left, ironically. On your left. Uh, <laughs> well, everybody's on my left. <laughs> That's true. Uh, is Jeremy ben who is the founder and uh, president and supreme leader of J Street, uh, uh, the uh, self-described pro-Israel, pro-peace organization in Washington, made a lot of waves in recent years. And uh, this here is Jane Harmon. Uh, and if you don't know Jane Harmon, I can't help you. I just can't. I just can't help you anymore. Um, so what I want to do, I, I think what I want to do is two separate but interrelated uh, subjects. The first is, uh, the first has to do with what a lot of people perceive to be the growing isolationism or at least growing feeling uh, of disengagement on the part of the American public about the Middle East 12 years after 9-11 and, 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 and sort of assessing the depth of that feeling and understanding its implications. And then the second piece, which is not, not unrelated, uh, has to do with Middle East peacemaking. It's in the, it's in the news again, uh, obviously. John Kerry is in the Middle East uh, trying very hard to um, get the Palestinians and Israelis to agree to have a meeting to discuss what they would discuss at a meeting if they were to have a meeting. Um, <laughs> And, and the role that the American electorate plays in shaping the, the national dialogue of that and, and how it shapes administration policy. Um, but let me start, let me start on, the, on the disengagement question. I mean disengagement not in the literal sense, but in the sort of emotional, psychological disengagement. I want to start with Dave, uh, because you've, you know, you, you've studied this a lot. And, and I think five or six years ago, you know, I, I would have thought of Rand Paul as a really marginal figure in American politics. Um, but we see over and over again that Rand Paul, and not only Rand Paul, but people closer to the mainstream, uh, are, are really profoundly influencing the way people think about uh, uh, America's wars in the Middle East, the challenge of terrorism, the related issues of privacy in, in, the, in the fight against terrorism. Could you just frame for a minute or two uh, sort of the extent to which this kind of feeling, which is coming out of libertarian circles, is influencing the way we approach the Middle East and, and where the American public, or at least that segment of the American public that, that cottons to these issues, where, where they, what they feel generally about our, our level of engagement. Well, obviously, Rand Paul didn't start it. Rand Paul's riding a wave. Uh, indeed, if he'd run for Senate, I think, in 2008, the forces arrayed against him now would have defeated him. He ran in 2010 after uh, he won his prime bet after a year and a half of Barack Obama. And Mitch McConnell, uh, his, his awkward compatriot from Kentucky, uh, said, said later, I think a lot of my colleagues are finding their natural tendency towards isolationism because of Democrats in the White House. The Republicans not in the White House. Paul has, uh, has tapped into what was always there with conservatives. And conservatives aren't, aren't naturally pro-war. They aren't natural, uh, naturally interventionist. They're just not. If you, look at, if you look at polling on all of the conflicts that we are in now or might get into, if you screen down to should we intervene for humanitarian reasons, conservatives are always the lowest on that. If you, Syria, I think the, the latest example, I think Pew is 49% uh, of conservatives say that we have, there's a, there's, if there is a humanitarian reason, we should go into Syria. It's much higher for every other group. And Paul's taken advantage of that. And it's, I, I end up covering him a lot because he's, he's, he really is omnipresent. He'll take an uh, invitation to any Republican group. And any Republican group will basically cheer that message. 
a couple of weeks ago, he was at Ralph Reed's Comeback Organization conference, and for the red meat, the beginning of the speech was about how America shouldn't have, shouldn't fund, should give foreign aid to countries that were anti-Christian. That's all, again always been popular, anti-UN sentiment always popular. Coming back now, but then he said, uh, "I can't, I can't picture Jesus Christ at the head of an army." I can't picture him endorsing preemptive war. And that got applause, too. So something that people looked around the room there, and there are people who veterans of the Bush administration looking kind of awkwardly at more mainline activists, religious conservatives, saying, yes, that's, that's right. We don't, we don't need to get involved in more wars for that reason. So it's just woken up. I mean, that, the, that attitude that was there, I think, in 1998 with Kosovo that was dormant when George Bush was president, it was in their interest to help him get elected, uh, faded in a way that makes make foreign policy really complicated. I mean, if, if it wasn't for John McCain being on every Sunday show every week, I don't, think, I don't think that you'd hear that opinion in the Republican Party very loudly anymore. Richard, are, 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 is neoconservatism dead as a movement? No, it's, it's not, but what you, and I don't much like words like isolationism or disengagement. What, what words do you like? Neither do the isolation. I would yeah. use the, uh, what I think we're seeing is actually the return of strategy. And we're seeing uh, something of a corrective the United States has allowed its foreign policy be, to be distorted, and I would argue distracted, by the greater Middle East. Look, it's next year, in November of 2014, we're going to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the end of the Cold War, and it'll be on 11-9, 2014. And if anyone had predicted that in this quarter century, the United States, its principal investments in the world would be the greater Middle East, and this would be where uh, upwards of what? Over 3 million Americans served, if you add up the two Iraq wars and the Afghan war, uh, if you, had, you know, look at the total cost and so forth, it would have been inconceivable. But that's what we've done. So what I think, and strategically, I think there's a powerful argument for adjusting American foreign policy in two ways. Less in the Middle East, I'm not saying disengagement, I'm not saying ignore it, I'm saying less in the Middle East, let's talk about degrees, more in Asia, and more here at home. If you think about national security, to me, that is a far more sensible uh, approach. Now, there's a difference, I think, between that argument and those who say, no, nothing. And I think there is a bit of in intervention fatigue. And part of the problems, I think, that the neocons, to some extent, have wrought is when you overreach and you try to remake other societies the way we, we did in Iraq uh, and it actually wasn't just the neocons, it was also Barack Obama, who tripled U.S. force levels in Afghanistan. This is actually one of those issues that crosses political lines. The parties don't line up neatly. And you've got people on the left and people on the right who want to say in favor of doing lots of things in, uh, in Syria. I think there's a healthy and at times overreaction, at times understandable, at times it goes too far, reaction against uh, that type of in intrusive, ambitious uh, nation building abroad. So I think that's what we're seeing. Personally, I think Rand Paul goes too far. And I think, again, it, it, when things begin to veer into a kind of an isolationism that doesn't discriminate, it's obviously, I think, dangerous to our national uh, security. But I do think it is time for a corrective in how the United States addresses the world. But Richard, you, you've talked about uh, uh, putting, a, putting a pause on our interventionism, building at home, and, and arguments like that. Yeah. But I wanted to ask Jane, you, you know, and, and, and one of the critiques of your, of your viewpoint is that just because you, as Americans, want to withdraw from the world temporarily, I'm, not gonna, I'm caricaturing it, but withdraw, uh, withdraw but, but focus, focus not on, on uh, the problems of distant regions, but focus on problems here. Just because you want to do that doesn't mean that the world stops spinning. And, and so I wanted to ask Jane to, to, to comment on that and talk about the, the dangers of non-intervention. Well, the... First of all, the, the, the driver argument that reaches a lot more people than the fringe that Rand Paul represents is it's the economy, stupid, James Carville's old phrase, which is also applying in Egypt, where millions are in the streets today. I'm desperately worried about what's going to happen there and in other regions. But when Americans are asked, would you rather spend X billion dollars on Afghanistan or Iraq or um, use those dollars to employ Americans at home, the answer is obvious. Uh, no one has really made the case, and here's something I'm, I'm, I'm sad about, for why we need to continue to focus on regions like the Middle East. I don't disagree with Richard that there are limited brain cells, and a lot more of them have to be put on uh, Asia. 
However, if we don't get the Middle East, if we don't help get the Middle East right, I don't think we'll ever get out of there. And what was missing from the last panel, which was fabulous, by the way, and Richard, you were great, was any real conversation about Israel. And I want to bring it up now because that is something Congress cares about. That was my job, by on, the way. On a, that was my job. Well, too bad. Okay, let's bring up Israel. Because Cong <laughs> Congress focuses on that. It's one of the only things Congress supports on a bipartisan basis. And it is why I believe, and I think Jeremy does because we just talked about this, uh, the peace process has to, if John Kerry can pull this off, I will, I will nominate him for sainthood. Uh, the peace process has to start again. I know, Richard, you're gloomy, and many are, about how we, it will ever conclude. But the peace process will secure Israel's place in this churn of a Middle East. And if it's not secured soon, I, I fear it never will be secured. I want to come to Richard to respond to that in, in a minute. I would just note also, by the way, that you don't have to nominate John Kerry for sainthood, because John Kerry will nominate John Kerry for sainthood if he gets this. No, so you don't have to waste no, the paper. Jeffrey, no, Jeffrey. Don't waste the don't John waste the John Kerry's going to nominate you for sainthood. So John Kerry's going to nominate you for, I don't know. I'm not going to go there. Um, the, uh, Jeremy, uh, Two things. One is uh, a comment on the on the on the suppositions that, that that Jane is making. But two, what are the consequences of the thing that Dave, uh, Dave and, and, and Richard are talking about? What are the consequences for Middle East peace or the effort that America and we we I think we could all agree that America is the indispensable negotiator in the conflict between Arab and, and Israeli. What are the consequences for this level of I'm going to keep using the word even though Richard doesn't like it, uh, the sort of emotional or, or intellectual disengagement that we're seeing across America for, for that process. Well, I'd make two comments. One is that I think there's a, a distinction between the policy conversation and the politics, which is where your question yeah. started. Right. If you go back, not just generations, I mean, you go back a century or more, and you look at the, the same exact demographic group that is now applauding Rand Paul. This is a consistent feature of American politics, that there is a, a strain of isolationism. There's a strain of America first. There's a strain of focus here at home. And it has traditionally been on the right side of the political spectrum. And there was a long history where it was the Democrats who got us into the wars, right? And the Republicans campaigned against the Democrats for being the party that was always starting the wars and leading us into the world and all of that. So I, I don't think that this whole movement is anything new. Uh, I think that this is a existent strain within American politics that's bubbling up. It has found some justification in the events of the last quarter century that you're mentioning. And to say, we were right. We try all these things. And in fact, it leaves a greater mess than ever before. So I just, I just want to make sure that this isn't disconnected as some new phenomenon that's just emerging with Rand Paul. This is actually a longstanding tradition in, in American politics. Now, shifting from that over to what does it mean for Israel? What I think it means is that for politicians who have served in Congress and who run for the Senate or run for the White House, the people that they hear from, because such a large percentage of Americans don't care about American foreign policy, and they will raise the cost of gas, and they'll raise their yeah. kids' education, and they'll raise the economy broadly, a very narrow set of Americans raise issues like Israel in American politics. And the narrow group that you hear from as a politician on the issues of Israel and the Middle East tend to be more, let's say, knee-jerk pro-Israel, pro-Israel right or wrong. It, it skews the political atmosphere in which a John Kerry then has to operate, and it limits the tools in his toolkit. But, but, but that's not entirely fair, because you know the polls as well as I do. Gallup, you know, when they ask this question for the last 40 or 50 years, who do you have more sympathy with, the Israelis or the Arabs? It's always four to one, Israel. 60% roughly, Israel 15, 12%. Palestinians. So it's hard to, 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 to simply pin this on a, a small, intense lobbying yeah. emphasis organization, isn't it? Well, I think one thing we heard in the last panel, you know, and Secretary Albright really focused in on this, it's not enough to just have people. You have to have structures and organizations and voices and leaders, and you've got to be organized. And what has been organized in American politics, the organized structures that speak to politicians and speak to policymakers, come up with a very different set of views. Now, people may be more sympathetic, generally speaking, to Israelis than Palestinians, but they're also generally very sympathetic to the two-state solution yeah. and to American leadership. That's, quick, quick That's not the only organized group, though. Evangelical Christians absolutely. care intensely well, me, about Israel. Let me go to Dave oh, on that. Let me go to Dave on that. I know Richard is, um, 
has a deep desire to talk about the centrality or non-centrality of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, and um, I want him just to, to keep his powder dry for a second. Um, <laughs> Dave, talk about, I mean, I, I think, and look, look the truth is, uh, for, for people who follow this issue carefully, for people in the Jewish community uh, in particular, the, the, the rise in the, in, the, in, the, in the fervor of the love of conservatives for Israel is both an interesting phenomenon for a lot of Jews who tend toward the liberal side of the spectrum. It's a discomforting phenomenon. Could you talk about what's going on in the conservative world on Israel and, and if there are any counter strains to that? Well, for them, it's also politically pretty tooth toothless phenomenon. I mean, they made a greater push than ever and got more press coverage than ever in 2012 to pull Jewish voters away from Barack Obama. And I think the difference in Florida from last time was for four points, five points, almost nothing. I mean, and he, he won, the whole goal was basically to get him to lose Florida. Didn't happen. They thought Is the motivation to try to break away Jewish votes and Jewish donors from the Democratic Party, or is it something deeper about the way they see There's the There's a ham-handed effort to do that. Uh, and it, it, just, it just didn't work. Ham-handed, so to speak. It, <laughs> Culture I, I mean, it's, it's axiomatically ham-handed if it's ham-handed. Why did I set you up for a pun? Someone call it Chinese hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, no, it was very, it's very patronizing. It's the way that Republicans do outreach to a lot of groups, just, just assuming that you know we're right, but you're afra afraid to admit it, so come on over. And it didn't, it didn't work with Jewish voters, it turned out, with, with donors less so. They have Sheldon Adelson and then not really an army of David's following behind him. Uh, the, no, that, the goal, that, that was the goal was to, was to pull, pull one block away. Their voters, in, uh, as Jane, Jane was saying, are, are, are passionate about it for their own reasons. And it hasn't, I just think what's, what is new, we're all agreeing that America First ideas aren't new. I mean, the term America First is, in, is about 80 years old. Um, no, what's new is some of these politicians are trying to thread the needle and be against intervention, decoupling it as best they can from his, I mean, I keep going back to Rand Paul because he actually, he might, he might seem like a fringe figure, but if Iowa caucus and New Hampshire primary were tomorrow, he would win them. He's, he's up in both, both states. He is, he's a popular Republican figure. The way he likes to put it when he talks about Israel is that he supports them, they should do whatever they want, we should not intervene in the region, we should act independently, they should act independently. And he and a lot of Republicans have decoupled the way they think about inter intervention from Israel's security. I mean, it's, you don't get to 20% of people, just 20% of people right now favoring intervening in Syria uh, without people dis, de, you know, dis, de, decoupling the safety of Israel from what they see as us having blundered in Iraq. Richard, is that the one area, I, I want to come to, to what we were talking about before, but is that the one area, Israel's safety, that, that sort of sits outside the, the non-interventionist impulse on the part of Americans? In other words, if Israel were to be endangered by Iran, uh, and there's a theoretical case for that now, obviously, uh, or if Syria were to spill over, do you think that the number of Americans who you're speaking to about their feelings would, would jump, uh, the, the number of people who want to intervene would jump? First, I want to congratulate you for not using uh, pork barrel in your question. It'll uh, come. <laughs> it's number five. Uh, it's coming. <laughs> uncharacteristic restraint here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, I, in a funny sort of way, Jeffrey, we're going to have a test of that in 2014 with the debate about Iraq, about Iran. Mm -hmm. I actually think the debate about Iran will be, can the world live with an Iran that has, it's assumed by the way, that the diplomacy and sanctions doesn't, doesn't particularly work. And then if we get to a point where we are faced with a choice about whether to tolerate an Iran that is on the threshold of nuclear weapons, say, or uh, to go to war, which would be a classic preventive not preemptive, but preventive uh, military strike. Part of the argument will be a kind of esoteric foreign policy argument. We can't live in a world uh, of knock on you know, five countries in the Middle East having nuclear weapons. We can't live with a, uh, an Iran that's even more aggressive. That, that I think will be more an elite debate. And I think you probably will have a more gut level debate about the threat to Israel. And so I do think that will probably change. I, I, I'm not smart enough to give you the numbers, but I do think uh, it'll change debate. Also, because this is different than the remaking societies, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, in the midst of a civil war. Now, it may be that even if we were to launch a, a preventive strike, it's fairly large scale. People, if I just take 10 seconds on it, people should get out of there. The word surgical should never have ever been used in this conversation. It's a large scale strike. And it's also a euphemism for the word war. If the United States launches a preventive attack on Iran, there's suppression of air defense systems, 
There's, you have to deal with Iran's ability to retaliate. It is a large-scale military effort. It is not small, surgical, uh, discreet. Still, it doesn't, look, it doesn't feel, at least initially, like what we did in Iraq, like what we uh, chose to do in Afghanistan, like what some people are contemplating for, uh, for Syria. So my hunch is it's a slightly different, uh, different debate. And I do think the Israel issue will, 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 will figure in it somewhat more prominently. Uh, I, I want to I go to Jane and Jeremy on that. But just, Dave, a quick, a quick question, uh, which is, if the scenario takes hold in 2014, where do you think that, that the, those parts of the Republican Party we're talking about will be on an Iran intervention? If it's just, I, I think they would prefer Israel handle it on its own, but they, they would support America. You think Rand Paul would say, Israel, yeah. go ahead, do whatever you want to do? Oh, that's, he said that when he was in Israel this year. That's basically his position. Go bomb Iran if it, if it feels right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but, but, but we don't want to be entangled with what we do. And I think it'd be the same approach I think you see from them to any country that's overthrown its government in the Arab Spring. Good for you. Uh, we'll, we'll help. Here, here's, a, here's a plane flying overhead. We're done now. We're, going to, we're not going to help rebuild at all. Right. Jane? Jeffrey, I, I actually wanted to agree with you on something. That will be the first time in history, I the Aspen idea. But I, I, th I think you asked the question, maybe you don't believe what was in the question, but you said, should Israel's security stand outside this trend toward uh, with retreating from the world? And my answer to that is we shouldn't retreat from the world. And yes, it should stand outside, because I think the promise to those who survived this, the worst Holocaust in our history was that they would have a safe homeland uh, in a little piece of the Middle East. And I, I think that's a motivator for all those who think we should have intervened in Libya, we should intervene in Syria, we should have intervened in Rwanda, et cetera, et cetera. Mass genocide and, and, and uh, horrific things like this, uh, let's pick some more places, uh, motivate Americans, one of whose principles is human rights. I mean, that, that's an American value. So uh, I don't think Congress will quit on Israel. And I think President Obama has the opportunity, which he hasn't yet taken, to frame Israel's security and the future of the Middle East in an argument that articulates what our strategy is. Nobody knows what our strategy is. It right. seems extremely ad hoc and tactical in all cases. Let's come back to that in a second. But I, just one, one small disagreement. I, I don't think that with we're- With me? Our, You're disagreeing with yeah, me? Yeah, again and again and again. Uh, oh. the, I, I don't think that you could look at American history and see that we, uh, we're very good at intervening on the behalf of people. I mean, you know, no, the expression, I, the old saw is, you know, the expression never again means never again will we allow the Germans to kill the Jews in the 1940s. You know, I don't think that, you know, I don't see what I don't see what you see in terms of the, the American Or the Iranians impulse. to kill the Jews in Israel instead of 18 months. Maybe, maybe that's an exception, minutes. but Rwanda is more the rule. But uh, yeah. Jeremy, let's go to you. And, and I want to I want to get Richard and Jeremy talking about the centrality and the importance of the Middle East peace process to American national security and how the American public feels about that. But well, I just want to weigh in on, on two points as a, from a pro-Israel perspective. Number one is that the Iran issue shouldn't be framed through Israel. Right? The, the, the arguments for American engagement and action vis-a-vis -vis Iran need to be based on American vital national interests. And if military action ends up being taken, and if it is framed as being taken because of Israel, and if it doesn't go well, that will not work out well for Israel, and it won't be a very pro-Israel environment in the aftermath of a less than successful military action. So from, for pro-Israel activists, I think it's very important to step away from framing Iran as an Israel issue. The second thing is I think we also re need to reframe what it means to be pro-Israel, that pro-Israel doesn't just mean having Israel's back in terms of security at all times and standing up against all the enemies arrayed against it, pro-Israel means doing what John Kerry's doing. Right. Uh, that we have to understand that the single most important thing that the United States can do in order to secure Israel's future as Jewish and democratic is not simply provide it with military aid and not simply stand there as a bulwark against armies that are massed at its border, which aren't there anymore in the same way that they were 25, 50 years ago. The single greatest thing you can do is support John Kerry. And I can't believe the amount of skepticism and cynicism and negativity mm -hmm. that is directed towards John Kerry by some uh, who say that the, Look you know, over this there, is, not here. By <laughs> others. I'm surrounded by skepticism and negativity. Yeah. Uh, but if you are a friend of Israel, I think if you he's are nominating pro, himself for sainthood. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, if you are a pro Israel advocate, then you should be out on the streets building up support for what John Kerry is trying to do Absolutely. rather than beating it down and saying it doesn't totally have a chance agree. of success. I have two words Richard Haas. <laughs> This is your turn. Uh, well, we talked about it a little bit, the, uh, the, 
the last session, and shockingly enough, my views have not changed. Uh, <laughs> Maybe some of the audience have changed. Since then. Look, I've uh, seen views change on a single panel within 10 minutes, so it's possible. Not, not on this. Uh, there's, the qu there's just the question of the centrality, and then there's the question of process. But let me take off the table. I agree with the basic point. Of course Israel and the Palestinians would be better off if there were a two-state solution. That, no one's arguing that, so let's just, let's just posit that. We agree. The real question then is, what is the centrality this issue should have, given everything else in the world that, that's on potentially a strategic play? And, second, and g secondly, given the prospects for progress, because that's what you have to think about. Centrality, uh, I would say it's low. When I look at the principal strategic threats facing the United States and, and opportunities, one is Asia, the Asia Pacific, where the great powers are, where history is beginning to come alive. We do not want 21st century Asia to resemble 20th century Europe. It's that simple. But the tectonic plates are moving. Political, military, nationalism is beginning to get introduced. It's not simply an economic arena. Unless the United States is actively involved, watch this space. Watch what happens, the interplay of Chinese, Japanese, South Korean nationalism. If North Korea does not get rid of its nuclear weapons, watch what dynamics that it takes. This is going to be, this has elements of the great game. Secondly, if I'm right, the biggest national security challenge, in addition to all this, is what happens here at home. We've got to put into place, we've got to restore the foundations of American power. If we, don't, if we have that right, we will have the resources to deal with a lot of the external challenges. If we do not restore the foundations of our power, and that deals with everything from the economy, to our schools, to our infrastructure, immigration, uh, we are not. So, but, but Richard, Second, answer, this, answer this question. It, it, so for, America, for the best interest of America, yeah. is the, is the Israel-Palestine dispute the most important dispute within the framework of absolutely, the Middle East? Absolutely not. Uh, I would say, well, two ways. Is it the most important? I would say not. I, I'm much more concerned about the Iran nuclear uh, dispute. I also think that even if we were to succeed on it, it wouldn't affect the dynamics of the Iranian nuclear challenge. It wouldn't affect the civil war in Syria. It wouldn't affect the quest for political order and legitimacy in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, or anyone else. And on the off chance I'm wrong on all of this, and clearly there's people on the panel who think I am, then I feel, then the problem with their argument is the prospects are bleak. Virtually none of the preconditions of diplomatic success are in place if one assesses the leadership, its capabilities and its strength and its orientation on the Palestinian side, if one assesses the makeup and orientation of the, uh, of the Israeli government. And one other thing, which none of us have talked about, look at the strategic environment Israel is operating in. You've got an Iran moving towards nuclear weapons. The two countries it has peace with, Egypt, now controlled by the Muslim Brotherhoods, who knows what happens there. George Jordan, suddenly the throne looks a little bit shaky. You've got the civil war spilling into to Lebanon. Hezbollah is dominant there. You've got Hamas dominant in, in Gaza. Uh, this is not a strategic environment where I think any Israeli government, particularly this one, is going to take uh, tangible risks for peace. So part of what you have to do, I would argue, as a diplomat, is survey your, your, the opportunity cost as well as the direct uh, prospects. And I would simply say I think there's considerable opportunity cost to focusing on the Middle East. I don't see it materially affecting the, the critical issues in this part of the world, and I simply don't believe the prospects are good, no matter how hard a talented Secretary of State works. I, I want to give both Jeremy and Jane uh, an opportunity to respond, and then I want to switch subjects a little bit. Let's go ahead. Well, I just want to make sure that the perspective that I'm arguing this from is clear. The, the perspective I'm coming from is not the perspective of the State Department and arguing from America's national interest. I'm arguing as a pro-Israel advocate. And I'm saying that the message that pro-Israel advocates in this country are giving to the United States government needs to be that we do believe that if we are going to be a long-term friend of Israel and if we are working to secure its future, then the type of effort that the Secretary of State is making is the essential effort to secure its democratic and Jewish future. That's what I'm arguing. I think what you're saying is that from the broader view of American foreign policy in the Middle East, this isn't the key issue. It is a key issue, and it certainly does impact the United States reputation in the world. It affects its ability to lead on other issues. It does affect the ability to build a coalition against Iran. It affects the credibility of the U.S. and international bodies. It has an impact. It may not be the number one issue, but it certainly is the number one issue from the point of view of Israel's survival. And for those who are pro-Israel advocates, I just urge that we support what John Kerry is trying to do. I, I, I agree with that, but I disagree with Richard. I know he's not surprised. If you talk about the great power game, and I think it's worth talking about, what are the other great powers out there? Obviously, China and Russia, 
punches above its weight in kind of evil ways. But both of them have eyes on the Middle East. You have to understand that. We have strategic interests in the Middle East, including uh, defending our, our best democratic ally in that region, Israel. Um, but you know, we used to be reliant on Middle Eastern oil. We have military bases there in Qatar and, and other places. Uh, you know, the headquarters of our central command is there. I, I do agree that we've gotten these long wars wrong. I voted, uh, I, I voted to go into Iraq believing the intelligence. Intelligence was wrong, um, I, I, therefore I was wrong, but it wasn't misrepresented to me. I made a big effort to try to understand it. Uh, and on Afghanistan, everybody wanted to go in except one person. And, and we, we prosecuted that war, we took our eyes off that war and prosecuted it badly. But I'm still saying we have to keep our eye on the greater Middle East. We will be sucked back there because China and Russia will move into a vacuum if we leave. And oh, by the way, there's so much money in the Gulf states, and they're now Qatar and others, using their money to provide arms to who they, the, the people they choose in, in, in Syria, and they're giving money to Israel, which may, to, excuse me, no, they're not. They're giving money to Egypt uh, in ways that are at least keeping the Morsi government alive. Uh, I, I just think we, we have to deploy our, our global brain cells across the world, and when we do that, the Middle East has to be uh, a portion of those brain cells. We cannot move away from it. Okay. Uh, you want a quick, 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 quick intervention? Two things. No one's saying it shouldn't be a portion, but strategy is about proportions. And we can't do everything everywhere every time. We've got to make strategic choices. Right. And I'm simply saying whether it's the hours in the day for a secretary of state or the resources of an administration, I would simply, given everything that's out there in terms of opportunities and challenges, I don't think the argument right now, maybe at some other points, is to put massive amounts of calories into the uh, Israeli-Palestinian <laughs> effort. Well, don't think, Jane, I think you've got the Middle East wrong in, one, in another way, which is uh, I would like China to do more in the Middle East. Quite honestly, part of the problem with China is it still sees itself as a developing country. It thinks it has a pass. It thinks it has no serious international obligations. Well, China right now has the biggest straw drinking Middle Eastern oil. It's not the United States. We're moving towards North American energy self-sufficiency. One of the challenges for Chinese foreign policy and national security is to get serious about the greater Middle East, because China is far more vulnerable to revolution in Saudi Arabia, quite honestly, than anybody else. And Chinese foreign policy has yet to get serious strategically. Let, let, me, let me come back to American politics for a second and, and go to Dave and ask, uh, ask a hard question, uh, which, is, which is this. You, you study congressional politics intensely. You study Washington politics. Do you think uh, that, that, that the power of APAC and other affiliated organizations is such that Jeremy is correct, that we can't have an honest, balanced conversation in Washington about what needs to be done in the Middle East? I don't need your opinion necessarily, I need your analysis. Oh, the, the, honest and balance, balance, oddly enough, is kind of a loaded way of looking at it. Well, every, yeah. word, every word in that sentence was loaded. <laughs> so just don't worry about loadedness. No, they, they've been very, they actually, I think the, the, the one fight you saw, the, the big foreign policy fight that actually happened this year was the Hegel confirmation. APEC decided from the outset not to take a side in it. And they ha you had on the right uh, new organizations, Bill Crystal's Emergency Committee for Israel, organizations, again, that, that were part of that project to pull Jewish voters over by convincing them that they were just being stupid by, by voting for Democrats, who demanded Republicans vote against them. They got most of them on board, but, but, and there was anger afterward. Right? You talked to a lot of those people that APEC didn't step in. But I think you know, strategically, APEC, because they didn't pick a losing fight against somebody who is going to be the defense secretary, retain, you, build, build, build up yet more cred with a re-elected Barack Obama, and no, still dominate the, that conversation. If, 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 they sw if APEC swings behind any kind of resolution, uh, you have this one example where, where, where you, somebody who, who did vote against some of those resolutions got promoted, uh, but I don't think that's a trend. I think they, they're still very central to this. But I just, it, that, that, again, that's the one thing <laughs> Congress is still, still has the stomach for. I mean, I, we haven't really talked about defense spending much, but remember, we, because Congress is full of, full of fools, they passed sequestration, they didn't, they didn't undo it. They, did, they, they, were, they were worried about the defense component of it, right? 700 uh, uh, billion of defense cuts. But they undid one thing this year. What was it? Air, it, it airline, it, yeah, FAA, FAA spending. FAA There's no effort whatsoever to restore the defense funding. Now, there is, uh, I, I think there... That's why I'm just separating Israel again, because that still is central, that still is unchallenged, mm -hmm. 
and APEC made a very smart decision in not picking a fight that they were going to lose, making, making themselves look like they were losing influence. They're not. They're just, one guy got through the wire, and he's not been followed by a lot of other people who've challenged them in the past. Right. Jeremy, let me, let me go to you for a second. I mean, it's, it's, your organization has had a, has had a big impact, uh, I think, in, in the mindset of many American Jews and supporters of Israel. But in Washington, in Washington, when the president wants to go talk to a pro-Israel group, he doesn't go talk to J Street. He goes to APAC. Uh, the president in his first term called for a preemptive, or as a precondition, a settlement freeze. Netanyahu government said no, and Obama had nothing to come back with. And when he went to Israel a couple of months ago, he dropped that precondition. So it, it seems like the trends in Washington are actually working, despite J Street's presence, working against J Street. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I mean, there's no question that J Street is, is on an uphill uh, incline. I mean, we are pushing a stone uphill. There's no question. We started five years ago in my basement, you know, with no, with no money and two employees. So, yes, we haven't quite been able to defeat one of the most successful lobbying efforts that's happened in American history. Uh, and, and we haven't been able to balance the scales out. But I think our case to the American Jewish community, our case to American foreign policymakers, is that the correct voice to be pro-Israel is to recognize what is the strategic long-term threat to the state of Israel and to recognize that that comes from a failure to solve this conflict. That as long as you have an occupation of four plus, maybe five plus million Palestinians, you are threatening the long-term viability of the state of Israel. And, and you have to change what it means to be pro-Israel in American politics. And it doesn't just mean voting for uh, aid to Israel. It doesn't just mean uh, threatening war with Iran. It means actually standing up for and fighting for a two-state solution. Um, before we go to questions, and we're going to do that in a minute, I just want Richard and, and, and Jane to answer this question. What would it, I mentioned the Gallup polls before, and they, they are remarkably steady through thick and thin, but I'm, I'm wondering, given the general disposition of Americans to, to, to look away from the Middle East, given President Obama's desire to pivot to Asia, given all that, and given some of the trends in the Israel-Palestine conflict, what would, what would it take, uh, what, would, what could cause a diminishment, uh, a lowering of American support for Israel uh, in Congress and out of Congress? Is there something that, that would happen in the Middle East that might cause Israel's status to change in the eyes of the majority of Americans, and certainly in Congress? Um, it's an interesting question. You know, because it goes back to something Jeremy was saying, that the, the nature of American politics is the majority of Americans is not necessarily a terribly relevant concept. If the majority of Americans was a relevant concept politically, we would have background checks now part of American law. Uh, the fact that 90% of Americans wanted them didn't translate into, into past legislation. What matters in American politics is intensity. And that's where, you know, it's, it's the reason that entitlement reform is so hard, gun control is so hard, and all that. So I'm not sure, you know, the real question, so the intensity would probably be still from the point of view of, of, of groups like, uh, like, like APAC. I think the one thing Israel has to worry about is the younger generation, and it's what's happening on campuses. And this movement to question this, this whole issue of Israel's legitimacy, and also, and just don't get me wrong here, I'm not agreeing with that, I'm just saying this is a force. And this is something to, to take notice of and be reckoned with. Because I think it's the, the, the reactions to Israel are different for people who have a certain generation, who remember, you know, who are alive during the Holocaust or, or, or remember sort of 1967 in Life magazine, having the pictures of the Sabra soldiers on the cover. There was a sense of Israel as underdog and all that. And I think with people coming of age now, some of the reactions of uh, emotional association with Israel aren't necessarily automatic. So I think there's a distancing, potentially, of the American public from the Middle East. So I, some will turn against Israel. I think, actually, the bigger question is simply one of uh, fatigue. Uh, one, one measure I'll give you is that events on the Middle East, we've noticed over the years, tend not to get quite as much interest as they used to, because there's a sense of uh, been, there, been there, watch that. And I, I think there's a certain loss of uh, identification with uh, what's going on in that part of the world. And that seems to me more than hostility or animosity, what people have to think about. Before I go to Jane, Dave, just a very quick question. You're the, you happen to be the youngest person on this panel. Does that ring true? Oh, completely. Uh, I, there's just less engagement. It has a lot to do with the fact that the Iraq war, one, went badly. Two, they weren't being, there was no threat of a draft, so it didn't feel, I mean, it, you, people knew, young, my, my age knew it was going badly, but didn't have that much of a personal buy-in. And, and three, that they, they did, they do remember 9-11, and that gave them a complicated relationship with the government where they're just used to it being involved in, in, in parts of their lives here. 
um, but being ineffective whenever when it, it goes it goes abroad. I mean, it's it's a it's a big difference. What about when the only war people's about, lifetime? What about that failure. specific feeling about Israel? Uh, about well, yeah, I, 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 it hasn't been the under <laughs> the underdog in the, it, for quite a long time, and that's I think. Uh, no, really, it's, it, that's not how it's viewed anymore. I've, it's actually been a while since I've been on a college campus, uh, and it, it wasn't really it wasn't really burning then. But even just apart from from media coverage, there's been a decades now where the plight of the Palestinians has been uh, campaigned in a, in a very smart way for young, for young people, and, and basically on the left. That's mainstream thought, Noam Chomsky, et cetera. Things that college students pick up that beyond you know. When you're 18, you read Ayn Rand. You're 20, you read Noam Chomsky. That's usually that's <laughs> that's 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 definitely mainstream. And it, you, you add At it 47, to 47, you read Richard Haas. You add it to their <laughs> lack of faith in what America's doing. <laughs> I'm patient. I'm you patient. have to like, like, <laughs> the lack of faith generally in American intervening. But, but I think, all, yeah. of, all of this then, drives uh, something Jeremy said, which is the need to preserve Israel as a pluralist democracy. The only way you do that is through a two-state solution that permits. Uh, the Palestinians to have their own government, hopefully not Hamas, uh, and uh, live under that government. And you permit in Israel uh, the, a, a pluralist population, which they now have, but one that is predominantly Jewish, uh, to thrive in a demo, under democratic rule. And that will not happen unless there is, and I, Richard, I know you're, you're skeptical that this can happen, but unless there is a final deal in the peace process in some near time frame. And one of the reasons it won't is because of the youth bulge in the entire region. People won't understand anymore what Israel's equities are. And oh, by the way, in Europe too, there's more cynicism about Israel. And mm -hmm. it, it matters to me deeply that we get this right and we get it right soon. And I am really pleased that John Kerry has picked this as his priority. Uh, Jeremy, in, in one minute, just, just frame this out a little bit more in the, in, the, in the larger context of a general feeling of fatigue about the Middle East and how that might affect Israel's support versus Palestinian support in the future. Well, I think that the U.S.-Israel relationship, we always say it's, it's grounded in shared interests and shared values, that that's what unites the countries is, is a sense of interest and values. I think if over the course of the next 10 to 20 years, if over the next generation, the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian people continues, we will lose that sense of shared values and it will turn against our interest to be siding with the one side versus the other. And we're gonna lose that sense of shared interests and values. And I think that will be a real serious threat to answer your original question to the long-term US-Israel relationship. Talking over a generation, over the next 20 years, we're not talking the next 20 weeks or months, but it is something that I think the young generation in particular feels a disconnect when it comes to the values. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna uh, go to questions. Just raise your hand and I'll try to point the, right over here, for starters. And please make this in the form of a question. You know who you're talking to. That's why I said it. <laughs> uh, my name's Larry Gelman and uh, I care deeply about the Jewish community here in the United States. And in terms, to touch on the issue about the Hegel issue and what wasn't mentioned is not only was he opposed by certain groups and not by APAC, but he was opposed because he was an anti-Semite. And, uh, and, and Samantha Power has been opposed because she's an anti-Semite. And uh, Thomas Friedman has been called an anti-Semite by Elliot Abrams, all because they've been either critical of APAC's tactics or said something legitimate, maybe disagreeable, about the government of Israel. And the question I have is as a trend, uh, have we started with like the Israel Brotherhood where it's our country right or wrong and anyone who questions it not only is anti-Israel but hates the Jewish people and is this sort of polluting in terms of the next generation and younger people saying a plague on both your houses, I have no use for any of this. And, and you're saying they were calling him an anti-Semite, not that, the, that he is, that these people are. Right. That was, yeah. That's exactly yeah, what yeah, I was yeah. saying the and they were doing it in print. The no, they, uh, it was clownish and it backfired. I mean, he got confirmed. I think. Uh, with the swinger, the swingier voters who might have been amenable, or with the general public who might have had an opinion at some point, you, people hear that, and it's uh, there's, a, there's a danger there if you if you make that charge too many times against people who who I think the case against Hegel was what three quotes over an entire political yeah. career. Seven years ago, he said, yeah. he thought yeah. we got yeah. it, well, we got it, we know the story. Uh, but oh yeah, the, the other I mean the other charge that's really awful is that people are un-American. Let's get over these silly labels. And I think Hegel's record was um, not identical to mine, but a strong record, and he's strong on Israel, and I'm happy he's our Secretary of Defense. But there was definitely a, there was an effort by the, the most hawkish people, you're right, to define any, anything. He, 
leaving aside his Vietnam service, right? He had an opinion of the way America should interact in the Middle East that was different than the Bush administration. In some ways, he was proven right, and they tried to say that his entire opinion was anti-Semitic. But that backfired. But this, in a way, is a pretty marginal story, and it sort of proved the marginality of neoconservatives because the the most Jewish organization said, "Okay, you want Hegel, you have Hegel." You know, but it goes back to this intensity issue that Richard raised, which is that the most intense and the loudest voices on this issue tend to immediately do what Larry said, which is they take a policy disagreement and they right. make you anti-Israel. Which, which, by the way, is a broader point that comes up again and again in sessions that we're doing here, which is the intensity of extremists right. in American politics is, is, is shaping and misshaping a lot of, uh, on a lot of issues, including the gun issues you mentioned. Is there, right. I saw a question over here. Yeah, can you bring that? Thank you, John Devs, Palo Alto. Jane, uh, I'd love to see Kerry succeed, but you just listened to NPR this weekend. The Palestinians are totally divided. The Israelis are totally divided. How, how can God get a get a what? agreement between these two? Who are you directing the question to? Jane. God, is, God isn't on the panel. God, you just called me God. How, how, God, God couldn't make the panel different. Say, Kerry, yeah. get an agreement uh -huh. when, the, when the sides don't even agree with themselves. You got a big promotion. Uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so. Just because it's hard doesn't mean he shouldn't focus on it. The hard, you know, we've solved all the easy problems in foreign policy. Uh, these are hard, and we have to focus on this. I, I would, you know, in terms of, of, of the basic values that Americans have, getting this one right is way up there on the Richter scale. And maybe it can't happen. At least he's, he's trying to get them to the table, offload the preconditions, and focus on things where there is agreement. Oh, by the way, that ought to apply to Congress in general. We ought to try to govern that way, but maybe we could make a small start here on an urgent problem. And Obama's giving him room to do it. I still think Obama could help this and help us understand you know, our values in the world, our, our strategic interests in the world, if he would address the overall uh, world and, and where he sees American, America leading. Can I get just, Richard, one minute intervention on that? Yeah, I think there are prices to be paid for trying and failing. Uh, so the idea that it's not simply the opportunity cost of all the time and effort, but every time you try to push this boulder up the hill and don't succeed, I think people take lessons. My hunch is this is going to fail, and if there's a chance for something to happen in the Middle East, I think it's much more f uh, through what people like me have called coordinated or orchestrated unilateralism. You, I can't imagine the day coming. It might just be a lack of imagination on my part. I'm willing to grant that where you're going to have a full-fledged agreement and people on both sides are going to accept all the compromises and they're going to give up some of their cherished positions. Much more likely at some point the Israelis are going to take a series of steps. Palestinians don't have to sign on to them, but they will live with them. And I think you will ultimately have a, something moving towards a de facto two or three state uh, solution. We'll see if the Palestinians can bridge their differences. But I don't think you're going to get it through a formal diplomatic quote unquote peace process. What's the third state? Well, if you have two Palestinians, you want to have a Gaza. I'm not saying I want to. I'm saying one of the questions out there. That's going to work out well. I'm not, <laughs> Jeffrey. It's, you know, uh, if, as Mick Jagger, that famous diplomat, once said, "You can't always get what you want," and we have to see what happens in the dynamics of the Palestinian mm -hmm. side. Also, Jordan. There's a lot in play. We're talking about in the last session. If we are in the early stages of a dynamic in the Arab world where questions of political identity are coming to the fore and the question of the role of religion and politics is front and central. Why does anyone think that debate within the Palestinian community is going to somehow be immune from that? Wait, wait, it is me, not. Let's go to the next question. This is we going can, to be central to this we issue. We do this well. all day. We only have another five hours in this room, so we can only... I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You can leave soon. Go Dana here. Gordon from Chicago. This is for Jeremy. Has J Street ever tried going with APAC and presenting... Um, a, you know, together saying, we want a two-state solution. You're both pro-Israel, and to always be against each other and saying, as J Street, APAC does this, or APAC saying that against J Street, why not have a concerted effort and say, as a Jewish community, we want a two-state solution, and we all want this together? Well, it sounds good. Uh, in theory, uh, first thing that would have to happen is APAC would have to agree to appear in public with J Street at some point, which, it, you know, when you have a monopoly on power and you have a monopoly on, uh, you know, the influence game in Washington, uh, you don't take too well to people coming onto the scene and, and trying to insert themselves in their voice. There is a disagreement in the American Jewish community, just as there is a disagreement in 
Israel, about what is the better future for the state of Israel. One group of people, and we see it taking over the Likud party, we see it in the settler party, uh, probably 30% of Israelis uh, believe that there should be a one state solution and they should take over uh, all of the, the territory in the West Bank and have no Palestinian state. There, there is a real serious argument happening in the Jewish community, not only in Israel, but here. We don't always agree. Uh, there actually is a disagreement over how far Israel should compromise. Where should Israel go? What should the United States do? So, you know, unity is nice, the idea that we would all come together and have a unified platform, but there's actually a fundamental disagreement within the American Jewish yeah. community over tactics and, in some cases, strategy and how you express yourself. Jane just had a quick. Well, I, I you know, I support APAC. I support other groups that support my views. I don't think you should address APAC as some kind of a monopoly. People choose or don't choose to join APAC, and politicians, I certainly was one of them, read. Uh, resolutions offered in Congress carefully and dial back some rhetoric that I always thought that I thought was too hot. Uh, but but the point here is, uh, I think, Richard, uh, that getting Israel right now is absolutely central as the Middle East realigns. And getting it right now means getting to some form of agreement with the Palestinians. And if we don't get there, I think Israel is Israel's security is in danger, and that's something. Uh, J Street worries about, APAC worries about, and a lot of other people who don't belong to either organization worry about. I saw a hand back here somewhere. Was there? Yeah, I'm sorry, right there. Yeah. Hi. Um, what's really thrilling about listening? Hold the, hold the mic what's really thrilling about listening to you guys is the level of nuance, the level of complexity, even when your disagreements that you bring to this, and it's a level of discourse that I feel like we don't have. Um, I'm curious if, especially to battle problems of calling Hegel an anti-Semite or talking about people being un-American, is there a value to try and, is there a value and is it there a realistic way that the level of political discourse could raise on questions of the Middle East? Could what? Could raise. Is there a way that you could raise the level of political discourse and would it even be valuable? Uh, Dave Weigel is an expert on political discourse. Go ahead. Might be uh, a quick answer. Boy, no. That's the, the, what's, <laughs> well, what's, the, what's, the, what's the media incentive? The media that covers politics wants, wants it to be as florid as possible, and that's going to continue to be the case. I think what you need is more debate. It, it would be excellent for, for humanity if we all talked in enlightened tones. And we were all, if, if everyone was an NPR host, you know, we'd have Utopia. I don't know who would clean up, <laughs> clean up after us, but uh, we're not going to get that. I think what you need instead is what you had in some of the, he the Hegel discussion, what you have from people we've referred to as fringe Republican figures, which is being just as obstinate and proud of your opinions uh, if you are skeptical of, of intervention, et cetera, all the things we've mentioned, engaging and not, and not getting back down when you're called an anti-Semite. Actually, Hegel himself didn't do that. Usually nominees just kind of have to sit there and take as many lashes as, as are, are being provided at that, at that moment. But I think you just, you just need more engagement and uh, you, you're never going to count on our people to back down because What's the trend in politics? I mean, how, are people getting more polite as they get elected? Are, are, are voters in primaries going for the more moderate candidates when they have the cho choice? No, you, and you have to adapt to that. Well, but something else that drives this that's very unfortunate is the paradigm in politics now is to blame the other side for not solving the problem rather than to work with the other side on a solution. And because there isn't engagement between the parties in Congress or anywhere except for Aspen and the Wilson Center in Washington, by the way, guys, because there isn't that engagement, uh, you, you don't get to good answers. The nuances matter. Congress is not very sophisticated as a body. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, uh, they're not all fools, though. But, but there are a few people who are. And if the platforms of committee hearings and debate on the floor would be more serious, uh, this debate would be had where it really matters. But I think you can be florid and still be serious. I mean, Lindsey Graham has breakfast and, and calls for Obama to be impeached over Benghazi. Then he has lunch and he calls for Ted Cruz to resign. And I mean, he, he, is, he, he actually is a player on all these issues while being, uh, some, some, I guess he, he's not the best example because people, for all, his, uh, for all his zingers, people do think he's a serious person. But no, think back to how angry you are when he, when he criticizes Obama over Benghazi. Uh, you, I think to engage at the, at the level in modern politics, you just need you just need to you need to be obstinate like that. I'm sorry, it's it's not perfect. But but it's a it's a real problem because the majority of people are moderates. 
Right. The majority of people fall in the middle, and what happens is they check mm -hmm. out. They get disengaged. They say, forget it. Why should I be involved in all this? Because they hear the extremes, and they hear the rhetoric and the vile uh, yeah. language that is used, and they say, well, you know why? I'm just going to check out of the whole thing. And it's very hard. What we try to do is we try to organize the moderates. I mean, that's what we try, mm -hmm. and to have the nuance, but people back away from that because they hear the type of rhetoric and the type of fight that comes from the extremes. Um, I think we have time for our last question there. And make it a big and nuanced question that encompasses <laughs> all of these subjects in a very sophisticated way and gives each panelist a chance to say something thoughtful. Yeah, I, I can probably do that. <laughs> no pressure. Or, or not. <laughs> or not. No, uh, pressure. no pressure on you. Unfortunately, it's just on Iran. Um, <laughs> well, that's a big subject. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a report by the uh, Hinckley Institute at Utah University um, that there could be up to 80,000 deaths, uh, civilian deaths, and uh, some military from strikes on Iranian nuclear facilities, um, especially because most of these facilities have a lot of radioactive and uh, chemical compounds in them uh, that could sort of float into uh, nearby cities if the wind conditions are correct. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, first, do you think that this is this this study is correct? And second, given the strategic, uh, political, moral consequences of that kind of attack on Iran, do you think that the mil military option really is an option anymore? And at what t point do we start to talk about containment rather than prevention? Can, can I just, uh, I don't think anybody here is an expert on radioactive uh, wind spread. So why don't we just stick with the second half and, and, and add on to that and, and talk about in the current American mood, is it even plausible to think about President Obama launching what you have described as a substantial military strike against Iran, given, given where the American people are 12 years after 9-11, 10 years after Iraq, you want to go just down the row? Uh, look, I think it's a serious political option. I hope we don't have to get to the choice of deciding on it, but if this combination of sanctions and diplomacy doesn't work, and so far at least it hasn't, odds are sometime next calendar year, this president is going to have to make, to say a fateful decision doesn't get close to it. It would be a, fa it would be a decision, whichever way he goes, of extraordinary consequences and the kinds of issues you raise about weapons effects, it's going to require an, uh, a rigorous, comprehensive, detailed analysis of what you think you can destroy, what costs. You're going to have to think through a lot of, I sound like Don Rumsfeld, but a lot of known unknowns. You're going to have to think through not just what you can accomplish, but how the Iranians will respond with what consequences uh, that will have. Uh, it's going to be, and at the end of the day, you're not going to know everything you want to know with enough precision or confidence. So you're going to have to make just a big decision, like all big decisions, with uh, great uncertainties, whether you live, whether essentially you don't act, which is just as consequential in some ways as acting, or whether you do. And that's the decision uh, this administration's gonna have to step up to again, unless some version of uh, diplomacy and, and sanctions gets the Iranians to park their nuclear program at a level that's enough for them and not too much for us. Dave, Dave do you think the Republicans would support President Obama if he launched a preventive strike on Iran? Uh, I think that's the one, the one situation they would now. But what, I, what was interesting about that question is you don't actually hear very much talk about who, what, what civilian casualties would result from a strike. I think if you read deeply into it. But in the, in the discussion, I feel like Americans are able to picture something being deleted from the map pretty quickly. They don't know what the facility looks like. They don't know what's around it. And if you, will, if you want to start the, before it happens, have, have a critical discussion of this, you should lead with that. lead with that, and I'd say, I'm mostly writing talking points for somebody's primary campaign, but no, bring back the facts, of the uh, discussions of how of the civilian casualties when we made what we thought were tactical strikes in the 90s and the blowback we experienced since then. Bring back how, how much blowback do we get from one drone strike that kills two, two people by accident? Quite a lot. How much would we get from killing a, a right. bunch of civilians in something that we all think we favor? I'm not even trying to, it sounds like I'm taking a side, but I'm just saying what he, what, what right. he brought up would be a good part of the, right. of the discussion right. if people want to be critical before but, it happens. Um, I want to hear from Jeremy and Jane in closing, but Richard has to go. He has to be on five panels at once, so he has to <laughs> leave. Uh, but thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you. And uh, if we could just have Jeremy and Jeremy and Jane, answer that last big question. Yeah, just one point on Iran, which is not simply that we don't understand enough about the consequences of what action would be. There isn't enough discussion about the fact that this isn't a solution. It isn't like you take military right. action and you solve forever the Iranian nuclear program. 
you in fact only delay it. Most military experts, both Israeli and American, will say that this would be a delay, not a solution. And you actually up the ante uh, for the Iranians and give them even more reason to try to develop that. And I think that's the you know, second and last point is that's another reason why something that was discussed on the last panel and last night with Nick Burns is this is the moment for a credible diplomatic uh, offer and a cred credible diplomatic initiative that goes beyond uh, what's happened before. Um, and Jane, uh, the, finally to you, do you think the Democrats in Congress would support President Obama if he launched a preventive war against Iran? Well, I... <laughs> Not, you know them. Uh, you were there. There are no good options on Iran. Uh, I think most people want uh, the combination of sanctions and diplomacy to work. I think you have to figure that if we next year, do, if they aren't working uh, and we don't act, I think that that sets a tone for us uh, across the world and these you know, global uh, tectonic plates that Richard was talking about are going to be harder for us to influence if we don't act after all that. But I want to make one last point, and I, this is uh, something I give Obama high marks for. He is trying to build a global coalition uh, around Iran, and most everybody's in. Uh, they're not in as far as, you know, some are in more than others. Um, but if, if the action next year, if it comes to military action, and I surely hope it doesn't, is the world uh, acting against Iran. It has a very different flavor from uh, the U.S. acting unilaterally. Will there be casualties? Uh, sadly, yes. A lot of these nuclear facilities are not in high population centers, but I worry that Iran may have redundant facilities under high population centers. So yes, just sets this back, but then after that, if that happens, and again, I hope it doesn't, there may be the preconditions for talking. Remember that Dayton didn't happen until there was a a bombing campaign in Bosnia, and that's not a, a good thing, but Dayton did happen, and now there is peace, although not much prosperity, in Bosnia. Thank you very much. It's a great panel. I appreciate you all coming. Thank you.